Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here for this digital thinking part of the Future of Cities Summit hosted by the Globe and Mail and by Tortoise Media. Um, we're here today to um, take a look at a new a new idea in city building, or perhaps an idea that's not that new at all, but is having a moment right now during COVID. Um, but before I get into talking about the 15 minute city, um, we should explain what a digital thinking is. Um, this is a conversation which is meant to include everyone, not just our speakers, but also members of the audience. So we would invite you to join in the chat, which is going to be hosted by my colleague, Save. Hopefully you can see it on your screen. And uh, also, if you are willing, uh, put up your digital hand. Um, you can get involved by actually joining the chat on video. So um, with that in mind, um, please be ready to join the conversation. Um, but our main speakers are going to be a very distinguished group. We have with us Rob Hopkins, founder of the Transition Network, Jan Gale, the Danish urbanist and architect, Hazel Chu, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, and Julian Eggman, professor at Tufts University. Thank you everyone for joining us here. So I'd like to begin with a question and I'll put it out to any of the speakers. Um, this idea of the 15 minute city is having a moment, as I said. During COVID, many of us have been stuck at home and have found ourselves living in a much smaller orbit than we've become accustomed to. This sort of opens up the idea as to whether our neighborhoods should serve us better, um, whether urban neighborhoods should be able to contain everything that we need from day to day. Um, this idea has been referred to as the city of neighborhoods. Um, it's been championed by Jane Jacobs and other people such as Mr. Gale for quite some time now. And the basic idea is that our neighborhood should contain all the amenities we need for day-to-day -day living. Now, um, given the circumstances we're in now, um, we've come to see that that is, in most cities, not at all the case. In most cities, people need to drive to shop in order to go to the hospital, in order even to take their children to school. And um, perhaps it's time to rethink that. And that is why um, a number of urbanists have been in the last few months have been elevating this idea of the 15 minute city, which had been circulating in a few places, particularly in Paris, where Mary Anne Hidalgo has been pursuing this idea as one that has added resonance for us today. But, you know, there are also some critiques of this model as to how practical it might be to bring everything into every neighborhood and whether that idea of a neighborhood that contains everything for everyone might not be accessible for all of the people who are part of the city and who are needed to make it work. So, um, Let's get into it. How valuable is this idea? Should we be building 15 minute cities um, and how well might they work? Um, Jan, can we begin with you? What do you make of this new turn in the conversation towards the 15 minute city? Did you say new? It's not at all. <laughs> all the cities we ever knew were 15 minute cities before the invention of the automobile. Actually, if we go 100 years back, the cities were based on trams and bicycles, and that would be so that most of the things could be reached in 15 minutes. It was the invasion of the automobile which exploded the whole scenery, and then for, the, for all these decades, we have been completely focusing on, on um, commuting and on um, mobility, but actually, all the old cities were 15-minute cities. If we made so some years ago an investigation of the size of city centers of all the major cities in Europe, mm -hmm. and we found a very interesting figure here, because say, taking all the cities and putting them next to each other, it, it appeared that all the city centers was about one square kilometer. That means one kilometer by one kilometer. And what would this size be? That is exactly how far you can walk on a, on a trip. And it's interesting that cities all over the world had this constant that the, the uh, cells are one square kilometer, a 15 minute city. Another mm -hmm. city who has these characteristics at, where you can go and study it today will be Venice where everything can be reached inside 15 minutes, because that's one of the old cities before the cars which have been, which have survived. And there we can study 
the benefits of having things close by. Right. But uh, an obvious counterpoint to that is that um, many of us don't live in Venice and many of us don't live in Siena or even in Copenhagen, uh, as beautiful as it is. We live in um, large, sprawling cities like London or Toronto or Shenzhen or even smaller North American cities, which some of which you know well, such as Edmonton, where um, economic activity and people are simply spread out over a much greater distance. So in this context, what does it mean to create a 15-minute city um, in a much larger metropolis? Are you talking to me? I could, but perhaps Julian, let's give you a chance to enter the conversation. Julian, um, you've given quite a lot of thought to variations of this idea, I know. Um, what does it mean in a large metropolitan context to create a neighborhood that has everything? Um, how might we do that and should we do that? Well, let me start, Alex, by situating this concept of the 15-minute city in a plethora of other great urban planning ideas like complete streets, like walkability. Who is represented in decision making? Um, who does the imagining of what and the implementing of what a 15 minute city is? How is the process carried out? Which neighborhoods are prioritized? Which uh, amenities services are considered essential? Different groups in society might consider different services essential. And what about the lower income workers who often have to make long commutes to work in neighborhood services that the re uh, well off rely on? Um, so, 15 minute city isn't really one if only the well off can stay put. So, in principle, I would agree with the 15 minute city, but it needs a lot more thinking about in terms of the equity and social justice implications. And I hope we're going to, um, in this conversation, get into those uh, issues. Excellent. Welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're just starting to get into interrogating the idea of the 15 minute city. And as uh, Jan has told us, um, it's really not a new idea at all, but it is one that has some currency. So I was just posing the question about how one might impose this idea or how one might build upon this idea of a neighborhood that has everything in a large contemporary metropolis. How does that look from where you sit? Funny enough, we actually, hi everyone, sorry, you kept on trying to unmute me and I kept on trying to unmute myself. So it just became kind of a, a mute tag there. Uh, we actually discussed this issue on uh, our meeting today because we are about to start off our development, development plan process here in Dublin City. It's an iteration that we do every five years in the new council. And with uh, development plan process, you start planning what your city will look like. And especially in terms of COVID, it's uh, the perfect time, I guess, to, to start looking at how your policy constraints, your legislative constraints will work when it comes to planning your city and what you have learned during COVID as well. What we have learned during COVID is Dublin, It's I'm just going to take Dublin, for example. Mm -hmm. Dublin itself is a quite a small city. Everything is, is quite compact. And what used to happen in Dublin was that it was a bit of a donut. So you can imagine a, a nicely filled donut, everything in the center and everything in the periphery would come to the center. Whereas now what we've noticed is that it's a ring donut in that there's a hole in the center and everything is out in the periphery. And when we go to the urban villages in the periphery, they work. Everyone goes to the village to do their shopping. They go to school locally and then they go to work well, remotely. So mm -hmm. when remote uh, working is lifted, we, we're not quite sure how that piece will tie in. But the whole point is those villages currently work. So how do we then per, uh, prescribe that for our city centre? And the best way right now is to separate that out into, well, what does housing look like in your centre to, faci to facilitate a 15-minute city? And straight away, it's there needs to be above shop living, which doesn't happen in the south side of our city center here. Mm -hmm. uh, what does nighttime economy look like when it comes to your city? Right now, it's just pubs. So uh, it's mainly pubs. Uh, in an era where Dublin had some of the best clubbings in, nice. uh, in the 80s and 90s, that's gone. In an era where there would have been theaters, that's gone as well. So we need to bring it back. And I'm actually on the nighttime economy task force for the central government now to look at how we bring that back. And then we look at education. We look at uh, how to place the schools. We look at how to uh, place trade. And it, it's all these little pieces that you have to put together to it's it's as I was 
trying to explain it's like taking my three euros duplo and kind of building it so in different places and going well this works quite well so um so in terms of implementation it's going through a planning process now which we're doing uh and hopefully in two years time you see a better um facilitated 15 minute city however that's not guaranteed because I said at the beginning, there's legislative, a legislative constraint when it comes to these things. And it's trying to make sure that we work around the, the, that those constraints to build what we want and what, what we need. Right. It's interesting you talk about legislative constraints. Um, I've been quite involved both in my home city of Toronto and more broadly in the conversation around um, reforming land use planning, which seems to be a critical piece of trying to achieve cities that in fact have everything in every neighborhood because as everyone on the panel knows well um you know we've spent the better part of a century across the west organizing our cities to segregate different uses different types of activity into different places um and spreading out as jan mentioned with the car at the same time so we have both physical and um regulatory changes to make um so let me um jump over to rob rob how do you think um we might politically or in a more political, uh, practical or technical sense, how might we achieve some of the changes that are needed to create a more integrated sort of urban neighborhood? And of course, um, should we? Great, thank you. Well, I just, I just want to explain, first of all, why I'm looking quite so disheveled. We're, we're in week two of lockdown here and my kids challenged me at the beginning to not shave for two weeks. So I look a little bit as if lockdown has broken me and I've turned to drink, but actually I'm just uh, rising to a challenge from my kids. So thank you for, for having me. Um, uh, I think what we've tried to do in the transition movement over the last 12, 13 years is, is, is kind of a, to develop kind of bottom-up community-led 15-minute cities. It, it, really, it interests me that in London, for example, uh, transition groups tend to work not at the scale of the whole city. There is no transition London as a kind of a viable organization, but there are transition groups in 50 neighborhoods across the city and they work at that neighborhood scale, transition Brixton, transition Crystal Palace. Uh, and what they do is they, they work with that idea of how do we make this place more resilient? How do we make the economy more diverse, uh, more responsive to this community and, uh, and what it needs, more low carbon? So they work at that kind of scale without anyone's permission or, or without funding, usually uh, building things like new food networks, building new vegetable box schemes, connecting those communities with the, the, the peri-urban farms around the city. They form community energy companies like Brixton Energy that are specific to that neighborhood. They create new food markets. Uh, they support new enterprises to come through that are the, the new enterprises that will step into that. They create innovative ways to, to retrofit and work within that community to, to, to uh, uh, insulate people's homes. And even in a city like Preston in Lancashire, where they've taken the idea of a different, a new economy for the city to a different level of saying, we need an economy that circulates money as much as it possibly can uh, within this economy, rather than it just being extracted out by big businesses. And the fact that we don't have a 15 minute city, as Jan said, this is what we did have, uh, but it has been taken away by, by waves of, of planning and, and, and big extractive companies coming in and dominating them. And I love to see places where you see communities um, reclaiming and rebuilding that kind of economy, but it's under a lot of pressure at the moment. And gentrification drives, uh, drives a lot of that away. Uh, but I, the, it's the bit that excites me is the 15 minute city for me, what Anne Hidalgo did when she coined that phrase, I don't know if it was, it was the first time I heard that exact phrase was from her, was that she, and I know she's been very influenced and inspired by the work that the transition groups have been doing in France and, and in other places. It kind of put a beautiful description on actually what we're talking about, that everything we need should be close to where we are. And as we start to get cars out of the city, it frees up so much space to do other things in, more space for play for community for food growing and so on and so on so uh, i would say that uh, any conversation about the 15 minute city there's a lot that the learnings and the experience of the transition movement uh, can bring to them. yeah fair enough and it's interesting to hear you bring up these sort of bottom-up movements um the um before i go on i just wanted to share a comment made by tony webster earlier who uh, pointed out that um joyce and ulysses um describes a 15 minute neighborhood um you know leopold bloom seems to uh perambulate his way through a, uh, a 15 minute neighborhood uh, entirely. Um, I like that very much and he's right. Um, 
But um, Rob, you've sort of opened the door to thinking about the politics of these questions, and I have found them to be very interesting. Um, in many cases, allowing more mixed use within cities really amounts to deregulation, which you might think of as a conservative project or a libertarian project. Um, but in fact, it doesn't seem to play out that way. Um, you know, there isn't a clear political constituency for making the set of changes that we might need to make in order to have the more integrated cities that we're talking about here. Um, we have had some people, particularly in North America, with the new urbanist movement, try to pursue those ideas, which again, have sometimes a bit of a conservative political valence, but they haven't really resonated here. So I suppose, um, and I am just going to quote Vincent Santamora here, who is one of our panelists, um, who says essentially that we have done this all before. Um, the neo-traditional neighborhoods of the 1990s in North America, you know, really tried to establish these um, this very idea in the suburbs. But um, its success has been limited and the politics, as I say, I think are a little bit complicated. So do we perhaps need to find a different formulation? Is this new idea of the 15 minute city one that will sort of bring people together um, in a way that can make change? Um, and is it going to, is that going to work? Anyone? Well, Alex, earlier you said that uh, in land use planning, you know, we've segregated out land uses. Well, in the US, we've segregated people. Mm -hmm. um, and we've explicitly used zoning. Um, and zoning at first, <laughs> mutualized zoning. And then when that was uh, made illegal in 1917, we used single family zoning. And most of the big cities have quite a lot of single family zoning, which isn't racist, but it means that people with means can afford to live in these, these neighborhoods. So, you know, when we talk about politics, the politics of these issues, I think we have to go back to some very, very uh, deep questions that we are now going through in the US uh, mm -hmm. about these neighborhoods. We know about what happens when we create these green or complete streets or livable neighborhoods. We are effectively greenlining these neighborhoods. Uh, these neighborhoods become whiter as a result. And um, we are just deepening segregation through using greening in many ways. Now, absolutely, do I wish that were different? Of course I do. But any consideration of the 15-minute city in the US has to think about what I said earlier about the fact that many of the workers in the stores and in the uh, services in these neighborhoods are going to be commuting from a long distance. Um, they have no hope of the 15-minute city. How do we reimagine um, what our cities can become without thinking about who gets to belong in our cities? And I think this tension between becoming a 15-minute city and who gets to belong in the 15-minute city is one we really have to think about. Not so much in other cities um, where racialized segregation is not to the fore, but certainly in North America, even in Canada, although you Canadians might deny it to a certain extent, we do have segregated cities. And that has to be the first question that we ask. Um, and then there are other political questions, which I think, you know, Rob was beginning to address. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. Thank you very much for that. And it is true um, that we do have racial segregation, even in Canadian cities, where, as you say, um, many of us might not like to admit that it's absolutely true. Um, and to expand a little bit on some of what you're saying, um, you know, you know, this history very well, but others may not um, zoning or land use policies that are meant to regulate things like separating noxious industries from people's homes, separating, you know, noisy commercial activity from people's homes have often been deployed in deliberate and systematic ways to achieve racial segregation and to put those noxious uses and highways in North America through neighborhoods which are occupied by people of color, particularly black people. So that history is, um, I think Julian's absolutely correct to point out that we can't it's talk funny. about these oh, policies. Funny. Let as, me give you, you know, two, as neutral. Please continue. Alex, let me give you two really good examples. So the city of Minneapolis is the focus at the moment of much uh, thinking about the long overdue racial reckoning in the United States. Yes. On many levels, if you look at the surface, it's a green city. It is a green city. It's one of the most bikeable, runnable, cyclable. Um, it's, it's got everything. It's got the best park system in the US <coughs> on the trot. It is great uh, if you're white and middle class. But if you look at the segregation, if you look at the wealth gap, 
in terms of home ownership, if you look at the income gap, if you look at the achievements or opportunity gaps in education, Minneapolis is off the charts bad. So this is where I come in with my concept of just sustainabilities. If mm. you look at the superficial level of a Portland, Oregon, or a Minneapolis, you'll think it's a green city, but dig beneath the surface, and there is this toxic stew of racialized zoning, redlining, uh, racial covenants. We need to get to grips with those if we're going to think about the 15-minute city, certainly in North America. Thank you. Um, and uh, we've got a comment from a pa from uh, an audience member in British Columbia, um, Gujindu Daliwal, who says, um, Vancouver has so much racial segregation. Look at areas like Surrey. I wonder if that is by choice or design. Indeed. Um, so I think we're going to be joined by an audience member to ask a question here now. Um, is he with us? Michael er Erlinger. Hi, Michael. What's your question? Uh, my question is um, for Jan. And before I begin, I just want to thank everyone uh, for this great session and, and for their time. Uh, it's, uh, it's a terrific opportunity. So thank you. Um, my question is, um, in regard to the 15-minute city, how can we... Um, how can we begin and and promote this concept just using baby steps? Um, how can we set examples for our fellow citizens and mo move the concept along uh, on a you know with more of a boots on the ground uh, uh, methodology? Mm -hmm. And Michael, you're in Winnipeg, Canada. Is that correct? Correct. Good. All right. Well, panelists, um, you know, how might uh, who would like to answer this question? How might citizens productively um, move this conversation forward? What would be a, um, a valuable sort of um, action for citizens? Uh, I would just w would like to, to really agree with, with, with firstly with what Julian said. You know, one of the best places I've been to uh, in terms of a city responding to climate change is a city in the northwest of France called Grand Saint which is a very poor uh, city, a uh, very high proportion of people um, um, on below the poverty line, where the mayor there decided that everything that they were going to do about climate change had to be in service to the poorest people in the city. And uh, so they, when they bought in low energy street lighting in the city, which saved uh, the municipality half a million euros a year, rather than pocket the difference, they distributed that as an income boost to the poorest people in the city. And around the poorest housing blocks, they took up all the, all the tarmac and concrete so people could create gardens. They made all the public transport free, all the social housing is passive housing. Uh, it was one of the best examples I've seen of, of really saying, when we start to decarbonize cities and you know, we, we haven't explicitly talked about the facts so far in this conversation that we are in the climate and ecological emergency. And all of this really, really needs uh, the name of the city is Grand Saint. Someone's just asking G-R-A-N-D-S-Y-N-T-H, I think. Um, and so, so for me, that actually a 15 minute city becomes uh, such a desirable strategy in the context of, of, of the climate emergency. And for me, where it starts uh, in the transition approach, we would say you start where you are and you start with mapping what's already around you, because some of the, although the, the elements of a 15 minute city that we would have had 50, 60, 70 years ago have been sort of decimated by supermarkets and uh, by kind of uh, extractive property ownership and zoning, as Julian said, and so on, there are still a lot of the pieces that we can start to piece together. And the conversations about who should be in the room, who should be in this conversation, where do we start? What do the different models look like? Is is what has underpinned all the stuff I mentioned before, where transition groups are forming their own energy companies for that neighbourhood, their own food systems for that neighbourhood. Uh, and it starts by getting people in the room, getting the right people in the room, having the right conversation, good facilitation, and always in the context of possibility. And actually the way things are at the moment aren't the way things always have to be. And what can we do right now without giving, without waiting for permission for anybody? Let's just get started. Hi. Um, yes. So, um, Hazel, I'd like to come to you in a moment because I'd like to ask you in this planning process that you currently have going, who is at the table and how you are taking care to ensure that the right people are at the table and that everyone is at the table. Um, but first, we have an audience member with their hand up. Nico McDonald, are you with us? Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I have a question about the uh, the idea that we want to turn the city into villages. Uh, I think to Jan's point, uh, just because the cities were like something in the past doesn't mean we should want them to be like that in the future. 
you know, there's lots of things about the city in the past, you know, dirt, disease, um, uh, you know, lack of safety and so on that we wouldn't want to go back to. And, you know, it seems a bit like a kind of middle class, you know, dream in a way that we should live in cities. And the reality is that just like with all other similar things, the middle classes will both live in their little neighbourhoods with all their facilities. And they'll also travel, in my case, across London. They'll travel to Heathrow. They'll travel to Amsterdam and Ontario and Hong Kong and Dublin and so on. Uh, you know, while everyone else, and I think Julian's pointed this out, you know, will be, uh, you know, all the people who are doing the services, the blue collar workers and so on, will be schlepping across the city at unsociable times, not able to get the things that they want and need. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's a, a, a fantasy. We, we, we moved out of villages and towns precisely to get away from being surveilled from the narrowness of village life and so on. And we mm. moved to cities because we want that diversity of choice in where we eat, where we work, uh, the culture we engage with, the people that we see and meet and so on. So I don't think there's a lot going for this. I'm not against having services in my neighborhood and so on, but I certainly don't think we should be either against the motor car or or trying to close down the city and making it into little villages again. Well, uh, Leopold Bloom did like the um, the anonymity of the metropolis, didn't he? Um, but um, Hazel, um, I think this is an important question that I wanted to put to you. Um, we've been talking about who gets to be at the table, who gets to shape a city that becomes inclusive. Um, how are you doing that? How are you thinking about the tension that we've been uh, exploring here? So firstly, just one thing about Lico's point, uh, I am against the motor car. <laughs> I, I, I love driving my, previously loved driving my uh, convertible MX-5 uh, to, to, to my very corporate job and I loved it. But at the same time, I do realize it's not sustainable. Uh, sustainable. When the other half insisted that we buy an electric car, we, I, I caved. I also then bought a bike. And to the point is, one way or another, climate change is happening. Whether we want to or not, we do have to all buy into the form of to to for climate action, and that's everyone's responsibility. Who needs to be at the table? And this need, this may answer Michael's point as well um, of what to do or how to plan a better city. Get elect better people. So elect those that will have. <laughs> forward thinking, and it may sound like I'm a politician saying that, but I will be the first to tell you that if any, including myself, uh, happens to not be able to think outside the box anymore and not be willing to serve the public that elected us, then they, we should be showing the door. So the public representatives that are at the table need to aspire to push the boundaries to make sure that the public good is at heart and what builds a community is at heart. The, other people that need to be at table are your architects, are your planners, are um, best um, practice examples across the world. Uh, I know Nico mentioned Hong Kong there, like my family's from Hong Kong. So I would have grew, grown up uh, at times going back to my granny in city center spaces where it is uh, to one of your uh, comments in the chat box, 800 square feet or less. Actually, in some cases it was like 300 square feet for a family living in it, in it. And it did work because again, the services and amenities were at the ground level. You would have these skyscrapers and the markets at the bottom and the schools then uh, a block away or less. And you would have less travel, more time. And however, but however, the trade-off was space. But saying mm -hmm. that, if you, grown up or if you were always um if you always had lots of space of course you're gonna not want to change and go oh i don't really want to move into this 500 square foot shoe box with my family but when you've grown up in cities that have less space it does work when you've grown up in communities that everything is around you and is uh, convenient, you may be willing to sacrifice that convenience for the space and when i say space if you're proper planning is in place you shouldn't it shouldn't be 300 square feet or 400 square feet for a family here like one of the things that we authorize 
uh, called co-living here is something that we all object to. So that's in the national uh, legislation uh, legislative framework. And this is why I pointed to uh, restrictions when it comes to legislation. There is a legislation in, in place to approve something called co-living. Co-living is literally a room the size of a disabled car parking space. And then you share facilities in terms of cooking and kitchen. And to me, I don't think that should be the case. So I think that if you are having family or even if you're individual, you need a little more space. So planning needs to take into, um, into, into uh, mind what is sufficient space for individuals, for families to then make sure that, well, it's a long-term solution rather than a patch for them. Um, and then lastly, yeah. sorry. Go on, please. I'm sorry. I just want to address one point in re relation to Jill Julian's point. Absolutely agree with the zoning and racial segregation, but it's also a class segregation. I, I don't know is it that a lot of people don't like talking about class differences um, across the world, but in Ireland, you definitely see it. You see it in the fact that your, your class segregation means there are poorer estates and richer estates. And to how to rectify that within a 15 minute uh, city, you mandate that every so if, if you are to put in planning zones that you mandate that what is built has to have what we call part five here, which is 20% social housing in any estate, which means that you have a mixed group. I would up that to 30 or 40% social housing so that you have, you, 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 you suddenly take away the class divide, even if people do have a class divide in terms of where they work, where they live is absolutely the same then. Right. Um, but of course, um, getting that to, to work the other way around, um, providing uh, social housing or low income housing in wealthier neighborhoods is always a very difficult political thing in any city. Um, Elena Lavoie has put a question to us. And uh, Jan, I'd like to send this one over to you. Um, how can we start having conversations about these issues without vilifying participants in the city building process of which developers and builders are essential? Jan, what do you think? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was actually thinking of, of a slightly different thing to say. It's not a coincidence that the idea of the 15-minute city pops up now and is being discussed in this forum. It's not because of COVID. It's because we are at a, at a watershed that uh, the whole world is changing in many ways. We have this enormous climate challenge. We know that the fossil cars are being phased out very rapidly, that we are going to develop new modes of transportation, of mobility. We are having also more and more elderly people in our communities. So there's a lot of things changing just now. And that is why we start to rediscuss how we organize our cities. For 80 years now, we have certainly followed the, 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 the the diversion of functions and also spreading of the motor car. Uh, and we have spread more and more the city out, so it becomes one hour and a half city. And But just as we have been able to spread the things out, we will be able gradually to concentrate, to be, be aware of the importance of how much time you spend in chasing various functions in a very, very widespread city. And we can actually, all of us politically, in various ways and in planning and architecture, we can try to do as much we can. There will always be travels which are longer. There will always be people who go to the other continent or the other city or the other country. But we can try to make more towards the multifunctional city now we have spent so many years trying to get away from the multifunctional city. So I think that we are in a very interesting point now where a lot of things will have to change basically because of the climate. Thank you for that. Um, we, we only have a minute or two left. I'd like to bring in um, uh, an audience member who has a point to make. Nick Baudouin Miller, are you with us? And do you have a question? Are you still there, Nick? Yes, right. I am. Oh, sorry. Uh, just had to be given the chance to talk. Yes, um, I Hey, yes. So uh, which question am I discussing? I've been having a few conversations in this little chat. Um, 
I guess the one that I'm kind of interested in now is, uh, yeah, I was kind of talking with a few people in, in the chat and we were discussing uh, the, how, um, the 15 minute neighborhood and how home ownership will kind of have an effect on that. Um, Cause I kind of see the 15 minute neighborhood as empowering residents um, as they have more access to the amenities and services around them. But at the same time uh, in Canada, uh, the, uh, the past um, or most recent head of the Canadian uh, Mortgage and Housing Corporation um, just mentioned somewhat controversially in the last year how we have to move away from the idea of home ownership, especially for younger generations. Um, and this would make it easier, I think, for the 15 minute neighborhood to be kind of realized, but at the same time, does that disempower people in those, uh, in these situations? If, you know, we kind of give up ownership to, uh, you know, landlords and the city <clears throat> and businesses. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the question. And then the second part is, um, as uh, someone mentioned, and it was mentioned by Hazel, um, you know, if we live in these kind of very small uh, places in the sky, <laughs> uh, so to speak, um, is it, you know, we really have to, I guess, focus on, you know, we don't have the same sort of uh, way to live, to fill that space, uh, to spend time in that space. You know, we, we have to spend more time in these communal spaces outside, um, uh, you know, I guess that would be kind of, you know, speculatively. Um, so we, how do we develop those communal spaces? I kind of envision that, you know, uh, cause as I was spoke, speaking with someone, how do we, how do you play in that space? That's only 800 square feet. Um, so I kind of see it as, as a possible solution, the idea of like building and integrating play into public spaces. So is it, a, is part of the solution taking the, some of these private uh, private occurrences that we do in our own homes and bringing those into communal spaces uh, and making those communal activities that we do together. Um, so if, if so um, I guess it would be interesting to, to focus your question on um, suburbs because you know what you're describing the you know the use of the public realm for recreation as well as other purposes you know is how the pre-car city worked um, you know and I'm lucky yeah. enough to live in Toronto in a pre-car neighborhood that has all of those amenities and so you know my two children don't just have our you know 400 square foot backyard but you know three parks easily accessible um, which you know is not a uh, familiar model to suburban North Americans but you know it works um, let us ask the panelists, though. Number one, home ownership is very powerful in the United States and in Canada. Should we interrogate that idea? Is it important to do so? Um, you know, and then how do we build up the public realm, or how should we think about building up the public realm? Julian, would you like to jump back in? Uh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, um, you know, there are some cities in the world where home ownership is really not as important. Uh, places like Vienna, and lo and behold, Vienna. Uh, always tops the charts along with places like Vancouver. Um, I think that we need to really think about urban planning as managing our coexistence in shared space. How do we share space better? Um, and Hazel, just want to jump back to a point you made. When I talk about people of colour, I'm also thinking about low income people as well. I wasn't specifically talking about issues of race. So I think about, you know, urban planning as managing our coexistence in shared space. How do we get to uh, a much greater sharing of our cities? And, you know, there's a, there's a whole sharing economy going on, which I think has gone off the rails because it's not about sharing anymore. It's really about monetizing and sweating people's assets. Um, but the true sharing city, if you go back in history and look at cities, the original cities were shared spaces. Everything from, you know, uh, washrooms and uh, accommodation. It was about a shared space. We've lost some of that. We have, and especially in the last 40 years of neoliberalism, we have privatized public space. We have increased um, individual gain. And as the great geographer David Harvey said, we're building cities for people to invest in, not for people to live in. Until we change that, until we change that calculus. That's why half those towers in Vancouver are empty. They are here in Boston. It's an atrocity. And I think if I were a mayor, 
I would not, as one of the previous mayors of Vancouver did, uh, require a uh, 15% tax on uh, foreign nationals buying these places, I would start putting homeless people in these spaces. Um, that's what I would do. There's plenty of space. It's just that people own it and they want to maximize their own personal gain from it. So yeah, I'm all for looking at creative ways. Uh, we're looking again in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, in New York, we're looking at rent controls. We need a much more robust rental sector and we need much more um, robust affordable housing policies and these affordable housing policies have to happen before not after the 15 minute city but before any urban greening um, that starts like the high line and then you put affordability in no that's not going to work the the horse has left the stable you need affordability before we start urban greening well thank you for that um you know and you know i think housing economists uh, generally would agree that affordable housing in expensive growing cities is absolutely crucial. Um, I would push back gently, though, on the idea that new construction and new housing, though it is expensive, is necessarily empty. That idea that we have empty towers in Vancouver has largely been proven to be a myth. Um, you know, so that I might suggest is a well, bit of... Empty, they're not 100% capacity. I, I don't say that they are empty, empty. Right. No, I understand. I just, you know, even the idea that new construction necessarily has significantly higher vacancy than existing housing is not necessarily has not necessarily proven to be true. But I mean, I think in cities, the very few cities in North America that are really hubs for the knowledge economy and are seeing great masses of investment and seeing great masses of migration, you know, there is a shortage of housing at all levels. I think there's, that's a, report a, in the Boston, there's a report in the Boston Globe about yeah. precisely that, that, that um, some of these towers being built in Boston are at, say, 30 uh, percent um, occupied. So, yeah. OK, fair enough. I mean, there may be local conditions that are specific and we shouldn't uh, go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I do want to bring in one more audience member, and it's David Gordon, um, the geographer who is a real authority on planning in Canada, who started a um, who's put to us the question that most people in Canada, just as most people in the United States, really do live in car oriented suburbs, um, you know, and how we might um, how we might address that reality with respect to this discussion. David, are you there? Would you like to jump in? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Alex? Great. Very quietly. Um, I'll lean forward. So Canada, the United States and Australia have a very unusual form of urbanization where over two thirds of the country live in very low density uh, suburbs. So I think the principal challenge for the 15 minute city in uh, these three cities, uh, besides the ethical and uh, inclusiveness uh, that my colleague has brought up is retrofitting these suburbs. Um, and it's a very, very difficult task. Um, so uh, as urban designers, we have to pay. You're dropping out, David. I'm not sure whether you're there. Um, yeah, it looks like we've lost David, but you know, I think we can see the question he was driving towards. You know, in the United States, in Canada, and in Australia, um, most people, and many people at all income levels too, live in car-oriented suburbs. So how might we think about retrofitting them in ways that are um, that are positive, um, in line with what we've been discussing earlier? Anyone? Jan? Could I, could I speak to that one? I, I, I would really recommend um, the work of David Holmgren, who is one of the one of the co-founders of the permaculture movement, wrote an incredible book recently called Retro Suburbia that is really about that idea of how do we retrofit suburbs? Where do we start? How do we bring food production and energy efficiency and water storage uh, back uh, into, into suburbs? And it's one of the best things I've seen on that. And I did just want to just say one thing that, that was from a previous question, uh, which was uh, the person who was talking about the idea that uh, um, that, that, that somehow it's it's a it's a, a kind of a charge that is often leveled at relocalization and and those these, these kind of movements for for more for more economic local resilience that somehow it's about protectionism and about going backwards and that somehow you know we might need a passport to get from one part of London uh, to the next and I feel like it's a really false choice you know that uh, as as Jan has said you know this is. Uh, a time now where the where, where the imperative of the climate emergency is absolutely vital, and alongside that, we also live in a time where we have an, ep an epidemic of loneliness. Someone just asked about that book. It's called Retro Suburbia by David Holmgren, 
uh, yeah, and someone's very thoughtfully put a link. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. And um, a planner here in Toronto has also made a reference to uh, Ellen, Dunham, Ellen Dunham Jones's books, um, including a new one on retrofitting suburbia um, from an American point of view. Um, Jan, you had something to say. Yeah. <clears throat> um, talking about the 15 minute city uh, and the suburbs, I know from Melbourne they have a very interesting idea called the Linear Barcelona idea. That is that by building more intensively along the transportation corridors, only seven story high though, and then they could actually bring everyone in the suburbs inside two, 300 meter from services with public transportation, with all kinds of shops and, and uh, medical services and whatever. And actually they could accommodate another 3 million people in Melbourne on top of the 3 million they have without at all taking in new land. Everything can be done by taking down 13% of the suburban sprawl and making it a bit denser around public transportation. That's why it's called, uh, it's called Linear Barcelona because Barcelona is very dense, but it's only six, seven stories high which means that the people living in these heights of, of buildings can still be part of the city and will not be part of the airline system. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think there's one critique that I've heard often from uh, thinkers and planners in the, on these issues in North America, though, which is that concentrating new housing, concentrating new density along transportation corridors also leaves the quietest streets um, untouched for the existing residents um, who tend to be wealthier and newer residents who are likely to be less wealthy then have to deal with the both positive and negative effects of being next to um, noise, pollution, disruption. Um, so the idea of a more widespread intensification of low density neighborhoods might be seen to be more equitable in that respect. Um, we don't have a lot of time left here. So I think um, I would just like to bring back one comment that came back earlier, um, which I think is a good place to leave it. Excuse me as I scroll here. I'm probably going to mispronounce your name and I apologize. Ayman Elwira um, said, and I quote, I agree that women should be placed at the center of the a center of attention, the center of the discussion and debate across their intersectionalities, especially for um, single parents and people who are of low income their particular needs, you know, must be um, centered and considered. Um, so perhaps that's a good place to close. Would anyone like to tell us how we might think intersectionally about the 15 minute city and make sure that it caters particularly to the needs, caters to the needs um, of everyone, not necessarily those who are at the center of these discussions. So I'm gonna jump in, Alex. I think it's not just women, it's across the board you need people from every background. We, we talked about class here, we talked about race here. So you need people from minority backgrounds, from different races, from, from diverse backgrounds and different classes and also gender to be at the table. Otherwise, how are you supposed to cater for people? How are you supposed to actually build something that will work for these people when you don't know what they want. And as good as consultative forms are, they don't normally produce what, what exactly is fit for purpose. We just talked about retrofitting there. Retrofitting is uh, paramount because of the climate issues we're about to have. If you do not have retrofitting of, of housing right now, you it, it will be a massive social injustice uh, to people when you're trying to roll out climate justice because it will end up penalizing the poorest of the poor with fuel poverty. And this is why you end up having to have large scale retrofitting. But look at Exeter, for example, they, they, they built a whole bunch of passive housing within their council estates and notice straight away that the um, occupants could pay their rent for the first time. They didn't have rent awares. They were actually part of the uh, community that had very affluent people in. That's when it mixed, it mixed well. So, and this comes back to my point of who do you need at the table that Michael Erlang Erlanger asked at, at the beginning. And you need a mixture of people from women to, to minority to every background and try to plan a better city. That may sound idealistic, but it does work, so.
Thanks. Indeed. And uh, people with disabilities as well, who are often left out and questions of accessibility, physical and otherwise are often overlooked in the planning of public spaces and in the planning of new buildings. Listen, we're already a few minutes over time. Um, I could talk all day. This has been a fascinating discussion, but I think it's probably time to wrap up. So thank you all for joining us um, for our 15 minute city session. And please join me, um, everyone in thanking Rob Hopkins, Jan Gale, Hazel Chu and Julian Agumon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.